Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be chasing bluegills. I'm going to share a bunch of tips that you can use to catch more bluegills this winter. And uh, I actually just drilled a big line of holes and dropped my underwater camera in the very first hole and there were bluegills there and there was there was a bass and it was there's definitely fish like pretty much right where I dropped the car. So uh, yeah, definitely got a little more exercise than I needed to drilling all these holes down this big line here. This is kind of a big weed flat that we're on, but I'll get a little bit more into some of the location uh, stuff later in this video. But for now, I'm just gonna set up the house and let's get to fishing. All right, so we're all set up here in the hub house and I got a little jig rod going. I got the underwater camera. It's a cool setup, but for the most part, what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna talk about location. And this is gonna be a two part series or whatever, this is video number one. And in this video, it's gonna be all about finding bluegills and crappies. So without further ado, let's jump right in. This is gonna be a lot of talking and I might mix in some fish catching, but for the most part, this is just gonna be a lot of really good useful information that you can use to catch more panfish this year or next year or the year after that. Tip number one is go and look for them where you left them. So if you're the kind of person who's got a boat and likes to chase panfish during the fall period, one of the best ways to find fish, especially on early ice, is to go exactly where you caught them during the late fall period. Now when you're ice fishing, you basically have a hole that's about this big and you can see underneath you, but that is about it. And now I'm seeing a fish right underneath me, right here. And so basically what I'm getting at is mobility is just an issue during the ice season because you gotta drill a bunch of holes if you wanna cover water. Oh, there we go. We got interrupted by a decent little gill. Let's see if I can get a decent hold for the camera here. Solid fish. Anywho, um, mobility is an issue during the winter period. And you know when mobility is not an issue is during the open water period when you can drive your boat around. You can cover basically like 30 holes worth of area in like 60 seconds just driving your boat down a break or over a basin area. So basically what I'm getting at is if you can find them in fall, those fish are not gonna be moving very far. I'm guessing a lot of you probably aren't gonna be targeting bluegills during the fall period, but many of you have probably uh, played around with catching basin crappies during the fall period. And you know, if you're fishing a lake that has a larger size basin, it can be difficult to find those fish, especially on early ice. But when you're out in the boat, you can cover so much water, you can find out where those fish are hanging out because oftentimes those fish are going to be in the exact same place that you left them. Um, obviously like they're going to be moving up and down and uh, up on the structure and then back off into the basin and they're going to be going down to the bottom feeding on bugs and there's going to be a lot of activity that happens but for the most part that school of crappies is going to come back to that basin area more often than not. So first piece of advice, look where you left them and uh, that especially holds true for crappies and it also holds true for bluegills as well. But most people are not, I got this all tangled up, but I, I think we're good now. Um, most people are not gonna be targeting bluegills during the fall period. Um, but if you do, you'll be able to figure out where those schools of bluegills are hanging out, whether it's out off the break, which we'll talk about later or up in the weeds. So there's a number of different places, but finding them during the open water period when you can be more mobile, can be extremely key. All right, so if you have the luxury of doing some pre-scouting before the ice season starts, like that's optimal. But if you don't, you're gonna have to end up going out and finding these fish. And the first biggest question that you're gonna have to answer or try to answer um, is are those panfish up in the weeds or are they out in the basin? For me, that just kind of depends on the type of lake that it is. So basically, if the lake is the type of lake that can support weed growth, that survives through the winter months, then that is gonna be perfectly optimal. As you can see, ooh, we got a bunch of sunnies coming in here. Oh man, that one came in and smoked it. That's not a bad one either. 
There we go. I'll let them have that little wax worm. And back down to the depths. Um, as you can see, like on the underwater camera right now, there's definitely some green weeds in this area. And right now it's the first week of February. And to actually have green weeds this late into the winter is really key. So if you can find good, healthy weeds, and in some cases it almost, it almost doesn't even matter what kind of weed, as long as it's somewhat healthy. And also one thing that you'll notice about like really bad, nasty weeds is it actually repels fish. So if the weeds are gross enough and there's kind of particles floating all over, I mean, that's just not a good sign. That means that the weeds are dead and they're all over the place and there's no oxygen in the area. So that's when I'm gonna be avoiding weeds, but weeds like this can be really, really good. Stuff like this that's laying down in the bottom can be good. Um, tall cabbage is really ideal if you have any of it that's surviving long enough into the winter like this. Uh, a few of my favorite lakes have tall cabbage and you'll just have bluegills and crappies that are roaming actually up kind of in the middle or even the top end of uh, those cabbage stalks, which is really cool. Like if you're fishing in 11 feet of water and the cabbage is up in like six or seven feet, like that's where those fish will be kind of roaming halfway down. So it can be a really fun bite. And for me, there's like a couple ways that you can kind of confirm that you got good weeds down there. Like if you're fishing in shallow enough water, you might be able to just take your arms, put them over your head and look down the hole and see what the weeds look like. But obviously like an underwater camera is gonna be super optimal. And another option is to take your jig and just drop it down in the bottom and just see what you can pull up here. All right, I think I, oh, that's a huge mess. I love these inline reels when I'm chasing panfish, but sometimes they can make a little bit of a mess. So anyway, um, what I'll do in those situations is I'll drop I'll drop my jig down into the weeds and I actually just did that because I let out a bunch of line. And as you can see, I didn't pull up anything because those weeds are good and healthy. Sometimes you will hook a weed and you can pull it up and look at it. And if it's like really soft and mushy, like that's really not good. And also like on the lake that I was on yesterday, those weeds were really gross. Like when I dropped my bait down to the bottom and then the second it hit the bottom, I just had a bunch of gooey stuff sticking on it. So that's bad news, you wanna get out of there. And when the lake is like that, you wanna push out off the break and out into the basin area. Now typically when I'm looking for basin fish, it's gonna depend on which species I'm chasing, whether it's sunfish or crappies. So let's just start with sunfish for now because that's kind of what we're chasing right now. Um, if I'm looking for basin fish, when I'm looking for sunnies, I'm gonna look just off the break first and foremost, like 10, 15 feet. You know, if you have like a nice flat that's like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 feet or so, and then it drops down into 25, I'm gonna look 10 feet off of that break, drill holes around those areas, just adjacent to those big feeding flats that you would normally be finding fish on if there happen to be weeds or good, good healthy weeds on top of it. Um, and basically, if you don't find them there, I'm gonna look for other big main lake structures, whether it's points or uh, saddles or anything like that. Anywhere where there's kind of like a transition from that harder bottom into mud, that transition area tends to be really key. And uh, with that being said, you know, when I'm chasing crappies, I'm actually gonna be looking all over the basin area. Sometimes those hard to soft bottom transitions can be really key for crappies but other times they're just gonna be suspended out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and when I say nowhere, I mean like, they could be out over 40 feet of water, 50 feet of water, 25 feet of water, whatever that basin depth is, that's where I'm gonna be looking for crappies. And you'll notice on some lakes, some lakes that actually don't have those uh, big feeding flats with a bunch of good weeds and whatnot, uh, those bluegills will actually hang out in the exact same area as the crappies and you might be chasing crappies during that low light period and uh, all of a sudden you get a big taller mark on your graph, that's often gonna be a bluegill. So once you've caught enough of them, you can kind of tell on your graph which is which, but essentially that's kind of my philosophy when I'm looking at either going up in the weeds or going out in the basin area. Like typically when I'm chasing crappies, I'm gonna be looking in that basin area more often than not and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but those key bite windows, low light bite windows can be really critical 
um, specifically when you're chasing crappies and also for sunfish too. We'll get, we'll get into that more later in the video. Um, but with the low light period, basically when you're in the basin, those crappies are going to start coming up off the bottom, following the bugs. They're eating the bugs. It's all about the food chain. So, um, oftentimes what you'll find out is that there might be a million crappies in a basin and you don't see any of them until like 2 30, 3 30, maybe even four o'clock, depending on, uh, how that particular lake plays out. Now, generally as a rule of thumb, when you're on really clear bodies of water, like the weeds are going to be really critical and on bodies of water that might be a little more murky or bodies of water that don't have a uh, very good structure the fish are probably gonna be more related to the mud where those bugs are coming up. So it all is just like a big determinant of the kind of habitat that the fish have available. All right, now it looks like that fish that was in the distance is coming in to at least check out my bait here. Maybe, possibly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about weed fish. Man, I'm a little distracted now. There we go. Not a giant, <laughs> but uh, when I'm looking for weed fish, there is a few different ways you can do it. Let's get him back in the hole. Not too impressive, you don't need a close up. Um, when you're looking for weed fish, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can use an underwater camera. And uh, I will just say right now, no matter how you decide to do it, you're probably gonna wanna drill a lot of holes. Um, and once you've got those holes laid out, and also I will say too, you want to drill the holes right away. You don't want to drill a hole, look around, drill another hole, look around, because what you're going to do is like every time you drill a hole, especially in your, especially if you're in somewhat shallow water, you're going to spook those fish way out away from that area. So what I'll do is like, I'll drill a big line of holes kind of through the area that I want to look at. And, uh, once I'm done drilling, like, I don't know, 15, 20 holes, I'll go back to the first hole that I drilled and I will grab my electronics, whether that's a flasher, whether that's mega live, whether that's uh, my underwater camera. And I'm just gonna put it down and I'm gonna look around and see if there's anything close by. So uh, my favorite strategy is to use the underwater camera because you can really, especially if it's clear water, you can see like everything, right? You can see what type of weeds you got going on. You can see if there's like, an awesome looking like cabbage patch over there in the distance that maybe you should set up on. If you do see fish, you can see exactly what they are. Um, like, oh man, that's, those are giant bluegills. You can, you can see if they're male or female even. <laughs> um, but yeah, it could be pike, it could be crappies, it could be bass. And you can, you can literally see it with your eyes. That's why I like the underwater camera and you can be pretty efficient just hopping around looking uh, and just seeing what's down there. And the biggest thing with the camera too, you know, like maybe you look in all the holes and don't see anything, but at least you can go back and say, well, hole number three had the best looking weeds. So I'm not finding anything, but we're just gonna set up camp in hole number three and hope, hopefully something will kind of cruise through and come in and crack you. So anyway, that's why I tend to like underwater cameras for this application. But uh, the more that I've played with it this winter, um, because this is really my first winter putting in like a lot of time with the live imaging setups. Um, I'm really starting to like that now even more because even when the water clarity is not great, you can see when there's fish anywhere as you like scan around in a circle and you can see, oh, right over there, 70 feet away, there's a school of one, two, three, four, five fish. And so I'm liking that uh, technology more and more, but obviously, you know, not all people are going to be able to afford mega live or an underwater camera. And if that's the case, then you're just using a traditional 2D sonar graph. And basically what you need to do is you need to drill a bunch of holes and then you need to fish those holes for a period of time. If you are uh, out in the basin, you can drop the sonar down into the water and you can see if there's fish there or not. But when you're up in the weeds, all you can see is the weeds. So basically, don't give up on a hole unless oop, there's a bluegill. Don't give up on a hole unless you fished it for at least a couple minutes because that gives the fish a chance to come in, take a look at your bait and uh, you know, whatever, either bite it or not, but that'll tell you if there's fish in the area. 
Now what I would do when I'm drilling these holes is I would make sure they're a good distance away from each other so that you're covering a good amount of water. And once you do find a fish in the hole, you know, let's say you have the 2D sonar, you're jigging, I jig in this hole for three minutes, nothing. I jig in that hole for three minutes, nothing. And after you do that three or four times, if you drill the holes far enough away from each other, you've covered a good amount of water. And once you finally do, oh, here comes a pike. This is gonna be fun, ready? <laughs> yeah, as you can see, I set the hook a little bit early because I don't want that fish to come in and swallow it deep because then he will definitely cut my line. Um, anyway, oh, and it looks like he uh, knocked off my wax worm. Um, once you do find a hole where there are some fish underneath it, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna, well, you could just fish that hole if you want to, but once those fish kind of like move from underneath your hole, you're gonna wanna have more holes in that area. So I'm just gonna like basically Swiss cheese the area and put like 20, maybe even 30 holes. Um, if you're confident that there's enough fish around, so you can hop between those holes because those fish are just gonna kinda get, gonna be moving from area to area. Maybe they're re relating to different weed clumps or whatever it is, they're gonna be floating around and you're gonna wanna be able to jump around chasing them down. So that's my general strategy for finding fish up in the weeds and staying on top of them. And uh, don't be afraid to move. Right now, we're set up in the fish house. And I will admit like this is not like the optimal strategy to stay on top of panfish. And maybe we're not gonna catch as many this way, but at least we're somewhat warm and comfortable. And right now it's negative five degrees out. So it's not like super pleasant outside, <laughs> but you can set up camp. That's the cool thing about weeds too. Um, is first things first, you want to find where those fish are. And once you've found where they are, you can set up your tent and just camp there and uh, wait for different schools of fish to move in and out of the area. If you Swiss cheese the area and hole hop around as the fish disappear from underneath your hole, you will definitely catch a lot more fish. But you can definitely also catch fish just set, setting up camp and waiting for them to come to you. Um, that's what's cool about the weeds. These fish are roaming around. They're actively feeding, they're hunting. Um, and as long as they're not in a nasty, terrible mood where they're pushed down into uh, the weeds and not moving around very much, which can happen. Um, but you know, on days like that, the bite's gonna be tough anyway. What I'm getting at is you can fish whatever way you wanna fish. You can fish super active, you can sit in a house. Um, but either way, as long as you're finding the fish before uh, you set up camp or drill too many holes in an area, um, you're gonna save yourself a lot of work and you're definitely gonna catch more fish. So don't set up your awesome house until you found them. Well, I feel like we covered down pretty good on how you can find fish in the weeds. So now let's change gears and talk about finding fish out in the basin. And uh, weirdly, it's actually kind of similar. Basically what you're gonna need to do is drill holes and find the fish. And you have a few different options. You can go right to the middle of the basin, which could be an option if the basin only goes down to anywhere from like 25 to 45 feet of water. That can be a good place. You know there's mud there, you know there's gonna be bugs there. Um, or you can kind of pick somewhere that's a little bit closer to the break, which is kind of what I like to do if there's a big uh, main lake point or weed flat or something like that. I'll set up a little bit off that, that flat area and I will look around from there. If I'm using like Mega Live for instance, and I have like a range of like 100 feet scanning in any direction, then I'll probably set up my first hole like a good 100 feet off that break so that I'm covering as much water as possible looking for fish. So I'm gonna drill one hole right away. And you know, when I, when I talked about looking up shallow in the weeds, I had mentioned that you want to drill a line of holes before you even look down one of them. And that's because you're up in shallow water and you're spooking the fish. But when you're in deeper water, you can drill that hole and you can drop your sonar unit right down and see if there's anything there. Especially if you're fishing in like 30 feet of water or so, those fish are pretty unlikely to spook. They definitely might spook, just depending on the overall mood of the fish in that lake. Um, but more often than not, even with 2D sonar that just looks straight down, like there, you still have like a decent chance to, of being able to see them in deep water like that. I'm gonna drill one hole and I'm gonna look around. If I don't see anything, 
Once again, kind of like up in the shallow water, I'm gonna drill a line of holes. Basically, if you just have 2D sonar, you're gonna to wanna to keep those holes a little bit closer so that uh, you don't end up skipping over a big school of fish between your holes because obviously you can't see super far out to the side. And if you have something um, like Mega Live, a live viewing sonar unit, then you can actually make those holes pretty darn far away. Generally what I'm doing is I'm going like 30 yards or 100 feet away from my original hole and I'm dropping the live unit down and I'm looking again. And that's just a way where you can track down fish really quickly. And one thing that can be a little bit tricky about that, sometimes on some lakes, especially lakes that are really clear, those crappies are not gonna come up out of the mud until the bugs do. And the bugs don't come up until the low light period. So you might scan and scan and scan all day, basically from like 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and not see anything. But uh, once that key bite window opens up and those bugs start to come up off the bottom, the crappies will just show up like crazy. That's something to consider too if you're not seeing those fish right away. Consider the fact that they might not be coming off the bottom yet. And I've even been in situations where they don't start coming up off the bottom until after the sun hits the horizon. There might be fish in the area, but they're just not ready to show their head yet. So the biggest key once you've found them is you need to stay on top of them. And the fish are often moving and roaming around when they're in the basin. Sometimes they're just sitting there. Um, there's definitely been situations where I've just sat on top of a school of crappies for like two hours or school of crappies and bluegills, whatever it is. But more often than not, they're kind of roaming around. And so to stay on top of them, once you have found some fish, uh, you know, with whatever technology you're using, um, you're gonna wanna Swiss cheese that area just like you would up in the weeds. And as those fish are kind of roaming around, you're gonna wanna hop around between those holes and find them. Now, if, uh, if you're fishing with a buddy, that can be a good way to kind of keep track of where they are. So if you're fishing somewhat close to your buddy and all of a sudden the fish are gone, they're not on your screen anymore, um, you can be like, hey, you know, are they come, going that way? And if your buddy's not seeing them on his screen and he's just, you know, one hole over, um, they probably went this way. So maybe hop in, hop in the hole on the other side. Uh, another option, obviously, is like if you're using um, live sonar, you can just scan to figure out which direction they're swimming. So obviously, it's just like fishing up shallow. The more you move around to stay on top of them, uh, the more you're going to catch. But you can also set up camp in the tent, the hub house, or uh, flip over or whatever you're fishing in and catch plenty of fish too. So either option is definitely viable. It just depends on how hardcore you wanna be. All right, so last up on the topic of location, we're gonna talk a little bit about bite windows. And the reason why bite windows kind of relate to location is the fact that if you're looking for fish at the wrong time, um, and you rule out that area, you might have ruled out the best area to fish in the lake because the fish maybe were not active during that period when you were looking there. A lot of the bite windows will depend on the type of lake that you're fishing. If you are fishing in lakes that are dirtier, there might be a good daytime bite all day long. And in some cases, in those lakes, the bite can actually get worse as you get into the low light periods. Um, so if you show up early in the morning, and don't find fish, like you might've just been a little bit early to the party. In those lakes, sometimes the bite can start at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or whatever, maybe right away in the morning. It can kind of depend, but if you show up at the wrong time, you'd swear there's no fish in the area, when in reality, you just have to wait for the key bite window. In clear bodies of water, that key bite window is often gonna be during the low light periods. So one thing that you'll notice when you're fishing up in shallow weeds, you could probably catch bluegills all day long. And like we've been seeing, you know, there's some smaller bluegills, some moderate sized ones, but it's not until the low light period when the sun is about to hit the horizon that the bigger bluegills to show up. At least that's often the case on many of the lakes that I fish. And you know what else shows up at the exact same time? The crappies. On a lot of the clear bodies of water that I fish, I'm generally not seeing crappies up in the weeds uh, until you get to that peak low light period. If you're not seeing the fish that you want in an area, but there is fish activity, maybe you might wanna move. Um, but you might also just need to wait it out a little bit longer. It's really interesting. I was fishing early ice during my 30 day ice fishing challenge 
and uh it was one of those deals where i showed up like 1 p.m or so and i drilled a bunch of holes i was scanning looking around using sonar underwater camera and you would swear there is nothing anywhere in this weed bed so basically what i did is like i said okay these weeds look decent so let's just set up camp and see if anything rolls in so basically i'm sitting in the house jigging hope, hoping something comes and the sun is going down 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 it hits the horizon and still nothing and i'm like well this stinks i'm gonna fish like 10 more minutes and then uh pack up if i don't see anything and like 10 minutes later i'm like just about ready to leave and then all of a sudden thump a crappie bites and uh it's off to the races catch a bunch of crappies and it was a good fun evening but uh anyway what i'm getting at is uh, don't give up on an area if you're looking in that area when the fish aren't active. I've seen it all the time. Uh, me and my dad and a couple buddies drilled out this lake that supposedly had some nice bluegills and we saw nothing all day. We got out there, you know, in the morning and looked and looked and looked and looked, drilled a million holes, checked all the bays, all the different areas. And it wasn't until the sun hit the horizon that uh, we actually started catching blue eels like we barely saw we barely saw anything like those fish were just buried down in the weeds and it wasn't until uh the very very end of the day that they were finally ready to bite and then even at that point it wasn't like the bite extended into the nighttime period and sometimes that does happen with bluegills but especially so with crappies where you can actually catch crappies for several hours once they finally start to bite but it was actually the case in this certain scenario where the fish actually only bit for about 40 minutes. So you really had to make hay um, while the sun was shining, so to speak. So anyway, bite windows can be extremely critical. And I think that's like a pretty good overview of finding panfish during the winter time period. Uh, hopefully you got some good tips out of this and I know that I'm missing something. So let me know in the comment section below and let me know whatever obvious uh, tips or topics that I was missing on. Um, so yeah, this was just a good overview for bluegills and crappies specifically. Panfish, I guess. I wouldn't consider like perch to be panfish, so that would be a whole nother deal. Uh, perch are actually uh, cousins to walleyes, so they're totally, totally different from bluegills and crappies. So that's kind of what we covered in this video. Hopefully you learned something. If you did, hit that subscribe button down below. And more importantly, Look out for the next video that's going to be coming out in a few days because I'm going to talk a little bit more about panfish tactics. This video is on location. The next video is on tactics. So it's kind of a two part series. And uh, actually, I will put it right here. If you happen to be watching this video, like after the second video comes out, I'll actually put it right there if I can remember so you can just click on it. But thank you for watching. And uh, we will see you in the next one.